And welcome to the Global Justice Center. We're happy to have you with us today. Uh, the Center for Global Justice is a uh, um, multilingual and uh, bicultural center devoted to research and learning and empowering a solidarity economy. For uh, the last three years, ever since Zoom, or ever since uh, the pandemic hit, uh, we've been doing Zoom, and um, we're now back at last to having a, uh, you know, a hybrid meeting. We have some people here in person, as well as some who are joining us on Zoom. Um, but without our usual gener uh, revenue generating program over the last several years, uh, we depend all the more than, than ever on you for donations. Uh, so if you are, are willing and able to make a donation, you can do so by going to our website, www globaljusticecenter.org. Today, we're fortunate to have with us um, Camila Pinheiro Honecker, um, who is Cuban and uh, has uh, been studying Cuban co-operatives. Um, this is a book that she put out on um, cooperatives and socialism. Um, it's a pleasure to have her with us again today. And um, we will give the floor to her. And then uh, after she finishes, we'll be able to, um, uh, to take your questions and comments. Um, so Camila, take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, you can hear me all well? Yeah, okay. Thank you, everyone, for your interest in, in Cuba and particularly on, on Cuban co-ops. Thank you to the Center for Global Justice for existing and persevering in, in hard, uh, hard times um, and for your continued uh, support to the Cuban people and, and its struggle for an independent future um, and a socialist future too, I would say. Um, I guess I'm gonna provide some of my public, well, actually I have some slides that I'm not able to share, but I, I, it doesn't matter, I can just talk but i in that in those slides i had a uh, links to um, and a list of my my most recent publication in in english and i just wanted to say that there is a much better looking book in case you read spanish than the one that <laughs> that uh, cliff shared uh, this is in spanish and free uh, online if you look for it i know the paul gray version is really expensive and also in Spanish, a, a compilation of articles on co-ops and the Cuban economic uh, model. And this is a very pedag pedagogical guide also in Spanish. So apologies that everything is, you do need to learn Spanish, I guess. Um, and so I, am, I was told I have tw 20 minutes. I hope that's still the case. But if not, I'll stop. I'll, I'll make sure to leave uh, time for Q&A. So I'm going to see once more if I can share my screen. Yeah, now I can. Great. OK. OK, so this is, I'm just, a, a, so you can see now a quick overview of Q1 cooperatives. Yeah, OK. So for those of you who don't know, uh, the, uh, the beginning of Cuban, of cooperatives in Cuba is really with the start of the revolution. 
Um, I'm gonna go very quickly because I assume you know all this. Um, the first actual cooperative started in in the late in in the in the early 60s. Um, and there are like three main waves in agriculture. Uh, I'm, I'm going to explain which one is, is uh, each of these three. And then starting in 2012, really after 2013, there, there were these new non-agricultural cooperatives uh, that started. Um, and some legislation has been taken to pro provide more autonomy and improve the functioning of these cooperatives, still a lot to be done. Um, finally, in 2021, August, uh, there was a legislation that together with other um, like small business, private businesses and the self-employed. So like one legislation that, um, created the legal uh, framework for all these non-state actors outside of agriculture to operate. And so finally the experiment with a non-agricultural cooperative was expanded. Uh, there are problems with the legislation that uh, we can share too. And unfortunately, despite the fact that uh, it has been mentioned in the guidelines since 2012 and and everywhere we're still waiting for the co general co-op legislation that brings together all the different types and allow for other types that are not being uh, possible to create right now. And for the institution or what we call support ecosystem that is need that we all know is needed for co-ops to really develop. And so what are these co-ops? In case you don't know, because I'm gonna, gonna, I'm gonna start mentioning them. The CCS are the Credit, Credit and Services Cooperative that started, that, those were the first ones. They were created out of members, farmers who benefited, most of them were uh, farmers who benefited from the first and second agrarian law. So they were able to finally have uh, ownership of the land they worked. And many of them decided to join maintaining the property of their land to join cooperative to receive services and access to credit, right? The difference with, this is the most common type of ag co-ops everywhere around the world. The difference, one of the main difference in QI is that the administrative staff are also members of the co-ops. Agricultural production cooperatives are not very common except for socialist countries, but I have learned also that in some countries, where uh, especially like young people decide to uh, access land together and they have like a worker co-op in agriculture. This is what the agricultural production cooperatives or CPAs are. They started in Cuba after the so-called institutionalization of socialism in Cuba with lots of influence from the Soviet Union, no? And, and so uh, there were uh, problems in, in the autonomy of these organizations. Uh, two, um, what is important also to highlight is that uh, many of these um, members of the CPAs um, also benefited from the agrarian reform and voluntarily, unlike other countries where it was a lot, there was a lot of forced collectivization, uh, people in, or these farmers, they did see an advantage in coming together and they sold the land to the cooperatives, no? So the, these UVPCs or basic units of cooperative production started after the fall of the Soviet Union uh, with the need to uh, transition to a different type of agriculture. And so the big uh, state farms were divided up in, by like areas and they, the uh, workers who work in, in those areas uh, in very quickly without much preparation uh, uh, because of the need basically for survival and the need to, to produce uh, food for the population. Uh, it was a very quick process. And so there were many problems, but these workers uh, ca came together and created an UEPC that was really like a hybrid cooperative because at the beginning it depended a lot on the state, state, uh, sorry, state farm 
from which it had a uh, who, who used to own the land and uh, right now they have total autonomy at least in paper <laughs> and so it's important to know that these cooperatives still have the land they work is in use usufruct no and they are the ones with the most problems you can see from all the problems in how they have been uh, they were created also so non-agricultural cooperatives, as I mentioned, it's, it's, these are the most recent ones. And they are, in, the in theory, they could be worker or producer cooperatives. So you could have uh, independent producers coming together in co-ops, but it's mostly worker cooperative. There are some cooperative, for example, uh, accountants who kind of work independently and the, but, the barrier between worker and producers sometimes is not a clear line. So you could say some, a few co-ops have features of producer co-ops, but it's mostly worker cooperatives. And 75% of them have come out of state conversions, but that number is diminishing uh, to the degree that new cooperatives with this new legislation have has been created because unfortunately it seems that the policy I don't want to go further, but the or ahead of what I was going to say, but the there has no there hasn't been that many new state uh, business units that have been pushed uh, or allowed to convert into cooperatives. So most of the new worker, uh, sorry, non-agricultural cooperatives are actually group of people coming together wanted to create a cooperative, no? Um, and what is important to know is that the state conversion ones, they lease kind of like the UBPCs, they lease the, the main building, the main equipment from the state, but at uh, negotiated prices. So that with this um, uh, non-agricultural cooperative that are created out of conversions from state businesses, kind of uh, which was similar to UBPCs, I think that luckily, many lessons we were learned from that process, all the things that didn't go well with the UBPCs. Fortunately, most of that has been avoided. So the, they, they have not been created with huge debts like, like the UBPCs. They only got to buy from the state business what they really needed and at a negotiated prices. And the lease, the prices for the lease are really very, very good. So how many cooperatives do we have right now? We have a CCS are around 2,400, CPAs like 850, UVPCs are around 1,400, CNAs around 470, no? Maybe a little more with the ones because this is data for, from October. And I think they are like, since then, maybe like 10 or 12 more CNAs. Um, and so as you can see, uh, the one that is most, uh, has the biggest participation, both in numbers of cooperative and membership is the CCS. Um, and you can see, that the UVPCs have a lot of the a lot of the land, uh, but you can if if I had time to show you there you can see that the land the amount of land they work or uh, on the lease has been uh, slowly reducing because more CCS are taking that land in as part of a process of what they call redistribution of idle land, no. So we can talk about the, what has led to that if we have time, but I just wanted to show you this big, this uh, quick chart, no, quick overview. And this is important to see too, to understand how I like the situation today is uh, that uh, because of all these problems that I mentioned with the UVPCs, the line in green, you see that there has been a steady decline in the number of UVPCs around 24 until when I checked many years ago, it was an average of 24 UVPCs that were dissolved by year. Um, 
And I, there, there has been on average, I think it might be around the same. Um, the CCS in purple has gone up and down, but it's because they fuse, no, they come together, they merge, and sometimes they divide up again. And so it's mostly because of that. And you can see the CPAs, is, it has been a slow, but still a, a decline in the numbers of CPAs. And the CNA, CNAs, the latest ones, um, there has been a, a steady the, the, the increase uh, after the very rapid set of a, like a few hundred that were created around the same time, resulting from these state uh, policies, no? So, yeah. So this is just for you to know that what, what is the context of all this that is happening around cooperatives in Cuba? It's because as part of the actualization or the latest effort to reform uh, the Cuban socialist model that started, some would say after Fidel calling in, 20, in 2005 in his speech at the university saying that we didn't know what socialism was about, that we were, um, we needed to rethink. And then when Raul came and the first things was the distribution of land. And so there was the, with the, con the guidelines and conceptualization, uh, the, 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 the process of actualization has meant um, a few things, but one of the most important things is that the, the participation of the non-state sector has to increase in the Cuban economic model. And so this was a forecast by the Ministry of Economic and Planning in 2011. And this is to show what they were hoping that the non-state sector would contribute to employment and GDP. No, we know that in employment, it has reached that, around that. And GDP, I, we don't have the data, but we know that a cooperative provide, agricultural cooperative provide around 80 to 90% of the food. And, and some of the uh, non-agricultural cooperatives uh, also have significant contributions to the economy. We don't, the cooperatives has, uh, they must report to the National Statistic Office. So we do know how much they produce. Unfortunately, the other non-state actors like the self-employed and currently the, the small uh, and, and medium enterprises, I don't think they have to report either. So I'm, I cannot tell you how much those other sectors contribute, but we know that if you walk around Cuba these days, you know that you can see the presence of the non-state sector, no? And there are many questions <laughs> and concerns, et cetera, that can be raised about that too. Um, so uh, how are these cooperatives distributed? Uh, of course, agricultural ones are mostly outside of Havana and the different kinds depends on the crops that they produce, but um, they're not, the agricultural are pretty much spread outside of Havana, and but then the new non-agricultural ones, they were concentrated in Havana, which is the very light blue, and the Western side of Cuba. Hopefully that's going to start to change. And I think the newest cooperatives that have been created, um, not all are from Havana, but I would have to check. The main activity, of course, uh, agricultural, uh, because that's what they, the, the biggest number is in agriculture, but also the non-agricultural cooperatives, there are some in light industry, construction, and most are around like uh, food services and some other services, no? Uh, I'm going to go quick. This is where the supposed origins of the non-agricultural cooperative. This is to say that, unfortunately, the idea was that this cooperative would help the local government solve many of the problems, but that has not been the case. We can leave that for Q&A. This is a little more detail on, the, on how these are uh, the different activities. I'm just going fast because I know we wanted to do 20 minutes. Um, so yeah, variety, but really concentrated on the three main uh, production areas that I mentioned. Um, and so 
what was the or is the vision? No, uh, I think we, we had a lot of hope and expectations after twenty after the experiment with the non agricultural cooperative started in 2012, 2013, really. And, um, then when the conceptualization paper came out, I think that was 20, 2017, 18, and then the new constitution in 2019, where the cooperatives are mentioned as the second most important important form of enterprise after the state sector. We, many of us got really excited and, and we were saying, yes, now we're gonna see a truly like more cooperative economy in Cuba. I know some, at least, I know there are people who are more, more patient than I am, but I'm a little disappointed that we haven't seen more progress and that we're still struggling with some basic things that are needed for a true like cooperative economy. But we want to continue to be optimists uh, and I, I can share some later, but this is what we were hoping would be the role of cooperatives in the Cuban new economic model, uh, which was to work together with the state firms and the, the in this now, in that time, at that time, the TCP, Trabajadores por Cuenta Propia, so self-employed, really encompasses the private sector, no? So now this should be like private sector. Um, and so we would, we were hoping that the cooperative would really contribute to, as we have here in this era, like helping, supporting the, the communities. Then so, uh, not just with the, the liberal, delivery of uh, goods and services, but also, as we know, being the schools of uh, values and democratic practices, participatory practices that we know and are needed for, for socialism. Hello? And oh, there is some uh, David on your side. And there is also the role that cooperative can play vis-a-vis -vis the private sector, as I don't know if people are aware of this, but in Cuba, the non-state sector includes the cooperatives and the private sector because cooperatives are not considered as part of the private sector because private sector is considered not just as non-state but as exclusive of others right uh, and so cooperatives could play this a uh, role of not just being schools of, of the democracy and socialist values vis-a-vis uh, -vis the community but also vis-a-vis -vis the private sector, they could be examples of best practices in terms of how to treat your employees and how to best serve the needs of the community. So like what they call like social responsibility, you know? And we know that the goal with the promotion of the current uh, policies for the private sector, the small and business, uh, sorry, small and medium businesses is to we don't know how, but we know they want them to contribute to the greater good, no? We don't, we know, we want them to be kind of like socialist private enterprise. <laughs> and the question is how, right? I don't think they know, but uh, we know it's a, it's a bit challenging, but uh, we know that you can have private sectors that do contribute, no? The, the, but you need to set up the institutionality for that, and you need to be aware that there are conflicting interests too. No, but it depends on how you how much can be achieved depends on how you set up the institutional framework. No, and how much, of course, what the values in people's minds. Um, and so I think I'm going to finish with these main difficulties um, and what I think needs to be done. So there are still some barriers to the autonomy, particularly for ag co-ops right now. And this is what we have seen. We have seen many of the UVPCs and even some of, I understand some CPAs have been dissolved because the state, the Ministry of Agriculture decides okay, we, this is not working and they are in debt. Yeah, many are in, uh, of the, especially UVPCs. Uh, we are, we, the Ministry of Agriculture is the one deciding these are going to be closed. We believe, some of us believe that that should be the decision of the members.
to decide whether to dissolve or not. And if we had an institute to promote cooperative, most likely that institute could take over and rescue these cooperatives, bring new people in. One of the biggest challenge of ag co-ops is lack of labor. And that's what happened with these UBPCs. Many left to, to be uh, laborers of the private uh, farmers, no, or the farmers, uh, um, because they got better income. And so, yeah, the, the problem, these UVPCs are, have been facing problems and we don't think that in, many, in some cases, at least there could be other uh, options beyond this solving, no? Um, something that has us very frustrated is, and I'm, I'm, apologies for those of you who are going to Cuba, uh, but I think it's important for you to know, uh, know the things that, that, that are, I can tell you many good things, but I always focus on what needs to be improved. No? And I think something that has been very disappointing is the delay in creating or allowing for the creation of the second tier cooperatives. So these are cooperatives of cooperatives or sometimes are called secondary cooperatives. So these are the cooperatives that would help primary cooperatives. So for example, in agriculture, one of the biggest problems as you see in the third bullet point is access to supplies, equipment, no? and these services. These are the tasks of state businesses that are supposed to have all the equipment and are supposed to provide these services and help access uh, for, uh, to supplies for this agricultural cooperative. We know that because of the challenge of the embargo, because of uh, mismanagement in the Ministry of Agriculture, but we also be, we know because of a conflict of interest in some cases, um, these uh, state businesses are not the be best place to provide these services to the cooperative. It would make much more sense and the experience in other countries has shown, for example, in Norway and everywhere where you have a well-developed ag co-op sector, these services are provided by higher tier cooperatives. So like a federation or a union, no, uh, provides and, and it makes all the sense because the ownership, the governance structure of this second tier or higher tier cooperatives is comprised of the member cooperatives. So they have a way of influencing on the service, the quality and the timing of the services they provide. The, the agricultural cooperatives in Cuba don't have really any way of making sure the Ministry of Agriculture is delivering what they promise. Sometimes they, one of the biggest problems is that the delays and payment to them. And so that's, I think if we had made at least uh, the mention of the second tier cooperative was mentioned in 2012. Supposedly they were going to be uh, regulated. So like the rules for how they could be created and function, et cetera, would be passed a year later. We are still waiting. I think that would be a big help to especially our co-op, but also some of the nascent cooperative because we know that is like the same concept of cooperative applies very well for cooperatives coming together to provide better services for, to themselves, no? And so we still have some cooperative education, but unfortunately, for example, the center for training that was the part of the Ministry of Agriculture that provided training to cooperative was a really, uh, uh, no, it's in the ANAP, in ANAP, had a center of, for training for the cooperative and that and it was uh, closed. The Ministry of, of Agriculture has something but it uh, really doesn't provide enough and it's not, not uh, just targeting cooperatives like an app was. More. And so there are many problems on, I think on the public side, public policy has been a little unclear uh, and and, and not uh, decisive enough, no? Some statements have been made, but in practice, still a lot to do. So what do we think that cooperatives need in Cuba? They need what I was saying, state promotion, state promotion policy that is effective uh, and that like 
right now we have some supervision done by the national supervisory body. So like a very generic supervisory body that is actually for state. So it's like La Contraloría Nacional. So it's, a, a, I don't know how to say it in English, but it's kind of like the auditing body, which is the same body auditing state businesses and institutions, right? And so of course they don't understand cooperatives. And so we, we think that we need specialized and pedagogical supervision. And that could be part of the, this instituto that is in the guidelines uh, that we're still waiting for it to be created. Uh, we, in this institute, the main function would be promotion, but we think that it's important if it's, ideally it would not be the same institution because the practice shows that it's sometimes better to separate promotion and supervision. But uh, I think at this point, we just want whatever we can get. And, and so of course, the general law of cooperative could help set up which body or insti institute or whatever, however it's called, would be in charge of promotion and, and supervision of cooperatives as well as creating other types of cooperatives that are not possible right now, like the second tier cooperative that I just mentioned. Consumer cooperatives are not uh, really allowed to, to be created and multi-stakeholder cooperatives. So, so I can explain what multi-stakeholder cooperatives are, but I think uh, just to be really concise, I think that um, if we really want cooperatives to contribute to local development and have a closer relationship with local governments, we can look at the experience of solidarity cooperatives in Quebec, social cooperatives in Italy, where local governments, especially in Italy, work close with the cooperative and in the form of, sometimes they don't call it multi-stakeholder, but it's a, a type of multi-stakeholder cooperative. No? And that's why we think it's, it would be so useful for Cuba. As I explained, second tier cooperative, why they are so important. As in addition to promotion and supervision, we don't have an institution in Cuba that represents the interests of all cooperatives. ANAP represents small farmers. We know some of those small, most uh, small farmers are organizing cooperatives. So the best thing we have for agriculture is ANAP, but we know that's not really what we need. So it would have to be some something much broader and of course uh, an autonomy uh, autonomous uh, representative body for cooperatives no um, we also need a network of organizations that provide provide cooperative education there is a master's in cooperative management and development i was actually a professor I, I, provided by flaxo at the university of havana uh, there are other universities that have some uh, at least research and some training around cooperative, but we don't really have incubation like and technical assistance for cooperatives. That is not what is done under some, some projects, not depending uh, on some small co uh, international cooperation projects. Um, as I mentioned, engagement by local governments have, has been a disappoint disappointment. Uh, in what I saw from my experience, many local governments were uh, truly interested in cooperative, but the signals that were sent were, were contradictory. So I'm not sure who can be blamed, but uh, there, it, that's an area for improvement. Um, and of course, I'm talking to people in the US, you know that I, I do believe in the better without embargo or better without blockade. We know we have many problems, but we do need to be honest and acknowledge that it would be much easier, much, much more easier uh, without the blockade or embargo and all these sanctions. So I'll stop there. And these are the, the publication. This is the latest, uh, the Center for uh, Cooperative Inter uh, in, at the University of St. Mary's.
has this uh, book and there is a chapter on Cuban cooperatives that you might be interested in. So I'll, I'll wait for the questions. Thank you all. Okay. Yeah, well, thank you, Camila. I'm very happy to, uh, to hear your report. Uh, I'm sure that there are those that uh, have questions or comments. Uh, let's, first of all, take those who are in the Zoom room with us. Um, just raise your hand and uh, I saw several of you applauding her. <laughs> okay, I'm Mark Ginsburg. Camilo, thanks very much for the presentation. Look forward to uh, reading um, more about the research. I'm wondering if you or others have done research that focus on the experience of cooperative members on a day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month basis. You, you, you discuss much more so the relations between cooperatives and um, you know, state um, companies, et cetera. But is there research that, that deals with the obviously challenging situation of of uh, collectively managing and working together. I'd appreciate whatever you can say. And if there are some specific references, I'd even enjoy that more. Yes. Um, so in the first cooperative we created in 2013, we did uh, uh, with a, gr a group of colleagues uh, research um, because we were eager uh, it was mo mostly as a way of influence and policy, but we did have some questions to see how people, how like the workers of this new non-agricultural cooperative uh, felt, uh, like was it really different? Like how was it different, if any, from their previous uh, mm -hmm. work experience as uh, state employees versus uh, cooperative owners? And so uh, we, we, I can link to those research. Um, there have been other research, uh, uh, mostly from what I see, from what I remember around, like uh, on the non-agricultural. There was a, there is a research I found uh, with issues around gender and like women participation. Mm, mm, mm. Um, these are all research from Cuba, I did find one that I cite or reference to in the governance. My latest uh, writing in English is that the one I list first and is on open access so you everyone can access. Uh, there is um, a research done by, I forgot the name who is, looking exact, exactly our member experience in, in, I think it was like five uh, or three or five agricultural cooperatives. So there is some research, yeah. Okay. Could you put the uh, links or could somebody put the links to the, those publication in the chat, please? I see Tom Webb has raised his hand. Uh, hi, Camilla. It's wonderful to uh, see you again. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, alas, it's been far too long since since I've been able to go to Cuba, but um, I, I have very good memories of visiting cooperatives in Cuba and working with the agricultural co-ops and visiting uh, a fair number of the, of the new uh, worker-owned co-ops. Uh, I get to, just one quick response to Mark. I remember in particular visiting a garment co-op in Havana, a garment making co-op, and we asked them uh, what they were most proud of. And they said, um, we're most proud of the fact that we have been able to reduce the cost 
of children's school uniforms, and I, if my memory is right, is by 20%. And I thought, well, that's not what you would have heard in a North American firm. <laughs> they, they would have been proud of how they had managed to squeeze a few more cents out of the kids. But, uh, and then we, they, the, uh, we, we asked them, uh, how can you do that? And, and still, they, they also told us they had raised their salaries. Said, how can you do that and raise your salaries? Well, they said, well, we don't need all the managers that we had when we worked for the government. We manage ourselves. <laughs> and so I, I, I was, uh, you know, I remember that so clearly and I'm, I have no idea whether it's like that in many co-ops or just a few or whether that was just one, ex you know, one example one example, isolated example, but, but it was impressive. And uh, the, the, the question I have, Camilla, is, is this. Uh, when I was there last, the Canadian government was being, uh, I think, somewhat helpful. Uh, and, and I believe that ended. Uh, and, and I just wondered, uh, where does the government of Canada stand now in terms of the American blockade and in terms of assistance to cooperatives in Cuba? Well, I, to be, to not be unfair, I should not, uh, I should start from saying that I'm not entirely sure uh, what if there are any projects that are being supported by the Canadian government. Uh, from, my, from what I've seen, it doesn't seem like they're supporting any specific projects. And what I can say from what I have seen is that it has been very disappointing on the position that the Canadian government has taken vis-a-vis -vis US foreign policy. I, I don't think they follow US script all the way uh, like we, they do with Venezuela, no? but um, yeah, they don't seem to be, they voted against the, they voted for the resolution that Cuba puts out every year against the embargo bloqueo. So they are still, showing internationally disagreement with the US embargo bloqueo in, in that regard, I think is because there are economic interests that they want to protect, but I think they are doing as little as possible to not create any conflict with the US. That's my, my view. So they are not a positive force, let's say. I'm not surprised. I, I'm not impressed here either. So, you know, anyway, uh, the, the, the dog wags its tail. Cliff, we cannot hear. Hola, Camila. How are you, my dear? So lovely to see you. I, I, I want to say how difficult self-management is. It's so unfamiliar. Obeying state managers is easy. Obeying capitalist managers is easy. But how do you make decisions together about your own enterprise? It's Tierra Incognito. And when the Venezuelans tried to do it, it attracted the worst. Uh, the uh, groups got together to apply for the funds, but they, when they got the funds, it turned out that they didn't want to do any self-management. They had already someone involved who was making some money. It was a there's something to learn from the Venezuelan failure, I'm sure. One thing, how about asking the folks in Argentina 
the 300, 500 factories there that are that have been recuperated, taken over by their workers in strikes and, and cooperativized, and they're healthy, and they're always healthy, because if you have only two uh, groups, uh, if you have only one group managing the workers themselves, you don't have managers and owners, you have workers managing themselves, it's extremely efficient and fruitful, and it saves cost to the government for managing them, as you've just pointed out. But they've been through this experience. I'm wondering, what do you think of how, how do you resolve conflicts in a, in a self-managed enterprise? But it can be done. Conflict resolution. How do you think of this? What can you learn? What can Cuba learn from the Venezuelans and from the Argentinians? For example, our friend Andres Ruggeri uh, in, in Buenos Aires is available for, I'm sure, to help uh, Cuban workforces learn how to manage themselves. Excuse me for taking so long. No, you will be happy to learn that Andres sent someone in his name. I'm kidding. The, Andres is uh, Ruggeri is uh, in, uh, I'm not sure what is his official title, but he was uh, pretty much leading the Facultad Abierta uh, of the uh, University um, of Buenos Aires Faculty of Philosophy. And, and he is actually an advisor to the new uh, executive director of the Institute for the Social Economy and Cooperatives in Argentina. And so the executive director of INAES, uh, this institute, went to Cuba and provided some, was invited to Cuba. And I know there is uh, in the intergovernmental cooperation agreement between Argentina and Cuba to work on this, I'm, I'm sure among other things on the around cooperatives and this institutionality, no? because the whole idea is to create this institute. We know it's happening. We know the second tier cooperatives are happening. We just cannot wait another 10 years. <laughs> that would be yeah. too much, yeah. And so in terms of Venezuela, I think in Venezuela, unfortunately, there has been a flip-flop of a few. And so the problem with Venezuela was that, uh, of course, uh, it's to be expected if you say, I, I do think that Chavez has been a, a, a great leader for Venezuela and the Latin American le and global left. I do think he did contribute uh, a lot to, to, to empowering the historically marginalized in Venezuela and created an alternative, a vision of an alternative society, but we are all humans and sometimes we say things that are not the most appropriate. And one thing he did say was everyone, it's very easy to create a cooperative. You just uh, come together in a group and apply to, for funding. And so that sent a very, bad message to people who didn't understand co-ops, were not really interested in co-ops, they just wanted to go after the money. And so we know that many of those so-called cooperatives that were created were the same five friends creating five cooperatives and, and each, gun, each one got a car or whatever out of that and the cooperative never existed. So, People I know in Venezuela, they say, yes, there were many problems, but putting all those fake cooperatives aside, we still have the biggest number of cooperatives in Latin America. In, in Latin America no? And so they, they, I, I, would, I encourage people to check, I think it's called Gestión Participativa. Uh, it's a group of people, Luis Delgado Cabello was is one of the leaders of that group, and he was uh, in charge of the body in, uh, promoting and supervising cooperatives in Venezuela before Chavez, and maybe a little during Chavez. 
And so I think, uh, yeah, there, there were many bad things in Venezuela, but don't push, don't think that, it, that everything was a failure. There were many good things and there are very good cooperatives, no? The, I think what is happening in Venezuela with the cooperative is that they have kind of like to be totally honest and transparent a little of what is happening now in Cuba with the cooperative, which is that uh, now like what is in fashion uh, is the small uh, medium, micro, small and medium enterprises, no? The SM MSMEs. Uh, if you go and talk to a, to a state functioner or a local government and you say, oh, I want to create a cooperative to, the, to do X, Y, and C, they're gonna tell you, oh, why don't you create a MSME? You know, like that's what they want to report on. <laughs> and so, um, so I think in Venezuela, the pre now, I don't know, but uh, before the big push that they have now towards foreign and um, private investment, uh, it was the, 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 what was in fashion was these uh, communal enterprises, no? Uh, which in some cases were really cooperative or community cooperative, but they were called communal enterprises. Um, in terms of, so basically they're applicable to what I'm saying that we need, which are like a type of multi-stakeholder cooperative, no? Um, I think that in terms of the how to uh, tackle conflict within cooperatives, I think that there is much less conflict in cooperatives that you would expect based on your experience and what you think that are people's interests in countries like the US and maybe Canada. I think that from what I saw of all the, the, the cooperatives that were created, the non-agricultural cooperatives, they did have the autonomy to decide how much they were gonna pay themselves. Uh, pretty, they, they, the the non-agricultural cooperative did have a pretty much autonomy uh, to like how to organize themselves internally. And, and I think that, that um, if you start from very transparent procedures and some basic educational level uh, of most members, I think that that's what I've said it has, is an advantage for promotion, promoting cooperative in Cuba, is that you're not gonna find many illiterate people who don't know how to read the rules and understand the, math, the addition and multiplication you know, uh, sentences to know how much they need to be pay, uh, they need to be earning from for what they work, no, and who cannot read the financial statement if they are presented, you know, like like. That. So I think the yeah having some basic capacity and uh, to understand information and some shared values is going to go a long ways to avoid conflict in case you do have, and of course, transparency. If, if you do have conflicts, there are ways to go to, to tackle that without having to go to the solution. And what I saw in my experience from the new non-agricultural cooperative in Cuba is that the ones that were dissolved, they were like two, maybe three that were dissolved because of conflict, but it wasn't because they started and then there was conflict emerged. They started from having some, like in the beginning, and these were created out of state businesses. And so like from the beginning, there was the way that they were created. It caused conflict among the different type uh, members. And so, so I would say that that's, conflict has not been very, common among the non-agricultural cooperative in Cuba. And if it has been a cost for the solution, it has been minimal, no?
a commune uh, uh, phenomenon in Venezuela. Uh, the, the, there's been work also recuperating the commune in Mexico by a fellow named Bruno Postil, who celebrates uh, the Oaxaca commune. Uh, there was a period when Oaxaca, when the city of Oaxaca, well, the state was uh, self-managed uh, and uh, the government was hostile to the independent unions. There are many cases of that. You could argue that the, the Zapatistas are a case of communal autonomy. And in the case of Venezuela, there's several examples of, I guess what you would say in the Cuban context, local governments and, com and, and cooperatives of finding a symbiosis and mutual, uh, mutual uh, relationship. So I just wanted to make, thank you again, my dear. Maybe I just I sh I should add that there is hope also in Cuba with the um, el, there was a legislation that was passed for the council or uh, consejo de administración de los gobiernos locales so how they should function um, and in the conceptualization and in the constitution. And in this uh, specific legislation, uh, you can see clearly that there is a push for more autonomy for the local governments. No, uh, by according to the legislation, they should all be doing participatory budgeting. How many are? Not sure, but uh, a lot of uh, assistance in the terms of uh, in terms of capacity building needs to happen. No. For and for this many times, because in Cuba this uh, this work like being part of this uh, local government councils is not paid work. You don't get the the people with the most experience or capacity, no, to to be running local government. So it's a never ending and very demanding work, but very important in order to have to really uh, have local governments exercise their autonomy and for the better of their the community, no? When the uh, urban co-ops were first authorized, there were uh, 470 some co-ops. And I see that now, many years later, there is the same number. Why haven't there been additional co-ops? Uh, I did have um, a more um, a more precise, just a slide for the non-agricultural cooperative. When you compare with the numbers of the other ones, it seems like it has stagnated, but it has actually grown um, the for example since the passing of the new legislation i think we have around 40 new which for cuba doesn't sound like a big number compared to the <laughs> no sorry not 40 it's a uh, in total is 50 so closer to 60 by now, new non-agricultural cooperative that have been created since September 2021. 20, so in like a year or so. If you look at the number of worker cooperatives in New York City, uh, it's pretty impressive. You know, New York City has, I think around 9 million people. Cuba has a, a, around 11 million. Cuba has had a, by now it should be close to 500 
worker cooperatives. And last time I looked in uh, New York City, it's less than that. And this is without capital, <laughs> nor like a federation of worker cooperative, which does a, a, a great job in supporting. Yeah. There are some who say that uh, Cuba's experiment in um, promoting urban cooperatives has been uh, pretty much a failure. That the uh, the Cuban people aren't aren't ready, which I find to be surprise, surprising, considering the emphasis on solidarity that has been so much a part of the Cuban Revolution. Um, <clears throat> but um, you know, we've heard this uh, point made from someone who has been very supportive of co-ops in the past, but. Uh, doesn't feel that uh, um, that they're doing well now. Sorry, I don't understand the, the question. Uh, what you said at the beginning was hard to hear. I'm sorry, what was that? She doesn't understand the question. <clears throat> yeah, I think you need to be a little closer. What would you say to those who uh, claim that um, the reason cooperatives, urban cooperatives, have not expanded more is because the Cuban people are not ready for the cooperative form. Certainly, there's been a big expansion of the, uh, um, the self-employed uh, uh, non-cooperatives. That portion of the non-state sector has grown immensely um, but the uh, um, the cooperative sector has not um, and, and the reason that has been given by by some is that the cuban people are not ready for cooperation yeah i've heard that people who say there is no cooperative culture in Cuba. And it's very funny to me because I said, if we don't have a cooperative culture in Cuba, where where is there a cooperative culture? So I guess the US has a cooperative culture and like other, the countries where there has been an explosion or, or like, a, not explosion, a growth of a worker cooperative because we have to understand in Cuba, we are just talking about worker cooperatives uh, in non uh, outside of agriculture and in agriculture with the CPAs no that I mentioned and UBPCs and the CCS are the uh, producer cooperative no the farmer cooperative that are you can find around the world if you look at the number of worker cooperatives and in, even like farmer cooperatives around the world those are not that impressive the biggest number of cooperatives are consumer cooperatives, especially credit unions or savings and credit cooperative. And we don't have any of those in Cuba. So it's pretty, when you look in the article that I that I suggested you you, you read the latest publication, I, I talk about precisely this. Um, and Cuba after Venezuela is actually the, the one, the, 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 the uh, the, 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 the country with the most cooperatives in Latin America. And if you count the just like uh, worker cooperatives is among the, 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 the country in the world with the most of these cooperatives uh, in regard to population, no? Relative to population. And so I think it's very, People who don't understand really cooperative and, and the, the international context uh, of cooperatives and who can feel pessimistic 
and frustrated with the little progress, as I mentioned, that we, we all saw this cooperative economy coming and it didn't materialize. And, it, and I say, of course, you cannot see more cooperative. No, despite, let's first acknowledge that we have the most number of, the biggest number of worker cooperative, maybe around the world. No, like if only if you compare, like I think it was like Italy, France, where in Spain they have some very loosely worker cooperative, like Sociedad Laboral. I'm not sure how many of them are really cooperatives. Uh, we have many cooperatives relative to our population right now. No, um, we haven't seen, yeah, like hundreds of new non agricultural cooperatives created because worker cooperatives. We know that for them to be sustainable, like you can have thousands created like in Venezuela, uh, but not in a sustainable way. In order to be sustainable, no, and have real worker cooperative that are going to exist two, three, five years from now, that's, that takes time. And the number of cooperatives that we have had without an entity that promotes cooperatives in Cuba, without an a, entity that that represents the interests of cooperatives. Yeah, we do have public policy that provides some preferential treatment to cooperatives, like a, a very reduced tax burden, like supposedly priority for state for leasing of state uh, enterprises, supposedly also access to, to credit. But we know that in this reality, uh, in the last couple of years, with the devaluation of the Cuban peso, yeah, you can have all these advantages, but the, the actual economy is working on the hard currency, not on the Cuban peso. So all this prefer, preferential tre uh, treatment it has become pretty much meanless, no? And the, what is happening right now is that those who have capital are the ones starting new businesses. And of course, the, the, the cooperatives are created mo in, everywhere, mostly by people who don't have capital. So we have to feel very excited by the fact that we have almost 60 cooperatives in a little more than a year that have been created without any of that. So I would say it's, it's always easy to be pessimistic, no? but I think people need to put things in context and understand uh, the reasons behind what is happening. On a more general note, um, I'd like your oh, assessment. Sorry, sorry Cliff, let me, let me. In Cuba now, um, the, uh, you know, the, the embargo, um, along with the pandemic that, uh, that uh, necessitated closing the, the tourist uh, uh, sector, has created even more severe hardship for the Cuban people. And that was, that was manifested in the, uh, in the demonstrations of, uh, of July 11th. And um, like your assessment as to what, what the situation is now in Cuba. Yeah, and sorry, I just forgot to add one idea because I get this question about why so few cooperatives, and I had the same question at the beginning, no? where uh, with the new legislation that allows for the creation of uh, some, um, the SMEs and the cooperatives. Um, and what I did an analysis of the before the legislation, how many private businesses existed de facto in Cuba, because the self-employees, they were like around 500,000 something, but, and, but we knew like at least a third of them were um, actually employees of the other, no? And so you could estimate the number of actual private businesses that existed before this legislation. And when you compare the number of cooperatives then and versus the, na the, the number of private business, de facto private businesses then, the difference is, is not 
it's pretty what has happened is like and they know they say 20 50 percent of the or more of the new private business are really uh, how you say uh, formalization of existing private businesses no like formerly self-employees and so when you compare the 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 number of uh, de facto private businesses then and cooperatives then before the legislation and the numbers that we have now is around the same the same proportion no so i think i'm i'm not scared like oh people i know there have been a few cooperatives that have converted into private business but i think that's a different conversation because from what i know those two that I'm aware, maybe a third one, uh, are cooperative that started out of conversions of state businesses where the administrator has a very has can, has very good connections with ministries uh, or has been um, has had a position in the ministry before. So I can see state functionaries who at one point I interviewed some of them and they said, oh, cooperatives is com communism. This is great, la la. The minute they can become managers and get rid of the people that are not productive in their view, they decided cooperative is not a good model anymore and they want a private business because yeah, they want to respond to public policy, but we know it's because it's better for them to be making all the decisions and, and getting better retri uh, retribution for their work, right? So I'm, I'm not sure that's a failure of cooperatives. Uh, <laughs> that's a, a failure of public policy, no? Yes, another question. In, in regard to the question that you raised, which was about the current situation and in here, Cuba. I think you can see me. I, I'm not a student of Cuba and I'm learning today, and I'm uh, very happy for the presentation. Uh, and what I'm gathering is that we, in Cuba today, you have cooperatives, you have state run businesses and you have some people who are independent uh, capitalists. What I'd like to hear a little bit more is, especially with your knowledge of the cooperatives, is are there economic advantages, uh, not the social advantages and managerial advantages, I understand that, of cooperatives versus uh, independent business or even government business. But I'm wondering if the people working in cooperatives are realizing uh, a better standard of living because of that. Thank you. Yeah, actually, the um, I'm I I can share my my slide, Cliff, with a reference to the work because that was one of the findings that we found when we did that research a year or so into the first non-agricultural cooperative, what we saw was that on average, the income of uh, workers in this cooperative that were formerly state business, on average, uh, it uh, quadrupled, so multiplied by four. Some say, oh, that's because the cooperative could take advantage of the exchange rate at that point, wh whereas, uh, which was one CU, CUC equals 25 C, CUP, so like the convertible versus the Cuban peso. Uh, but what I saw I, in my dissertation, PhD dissertation, I did uh, case studies of six cooperatives of this non agricultural cooperative, and I could see that the exchange rate only uh, explained like 30% of the increase in a net revenue, you no know, sales and red revenue, uh, because there was also significant increase in productivity and significant reduction of costs, no. And so I can say there is plenty of evidence to show to show that in economic sense, that in economic terms, it makes all the sense 
a, the cooperative model has shown to be a more efficient and productive way of organizing. And in agriculture, it's very evident when you see uh, the, when you compare the production of state farms uh, versus cooperative, depending on, on land, you know, like compared to, to how much land they have. There come. One more question. Okay, well, I'm, it's interesting. I'm, uh, I'm very fond of this whole you, discussion. Camilla. Amazingly uh, interesting. So uh, uh, I'm also not a student of uh, cooperatives, but I think it's a very interesting uh, concept. Um, uh, and I'm also not a student of socialism. Uh, and uh, so from uh, what you've said, it, uh, clearly we don't need uh, socialism to have uh, um, cooperatives thrive. Uh, you, you mentioned Spain, Italy, and New York City. Um, and so um, my understanding of socialism is that it's a state control. Um, and so if, if that's such a, a great idea, uh, then why advocate for cooperatives which are moving uh, away from uh, state control? Uh, so um, the, I think one of your slides showed that the non-state sector in 2010 was about 18%, uh, which I'd say is uh, very high for a, uh, so, so to speak, socialist country. But then it's even gone higher by, I think it was uh, 2021, up to about uh, 45%. Um, so that doesn't sound very socialist to me. Uh, it sounds like it's moving in a capitalistic direction. Uh, and as you mentioned yourself, it, it, that there are con conflicting interests uh, with those uh, two uh, uh, ideas, socialism and uh, this move uh, towards uh, the private, uh, uh, so to speak, a socialist, private enterprises, I think was uh, your term. Uh, the, there's a, a conflict in uh, um, the, the wording there. They don't really seem to go together. Um, so I'm wondering at what percentage of private enterprises does there need to be before there should be an admission and a, a recognition that, uh, frankly, socialism simply uh, doesn't it doesn't exist because it simply doesn't work, uh, as uh, exemplified by the fact that the average workers in the Soviet Union uh, lived with very low standard of living and no democracy, and even worse in Cuba and Venezuela. So what, why should we act, 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 advocate socialism when the three major examples uh, seem to have been disastrous? Thank you. Well, there, there are a lot of assumptions in your question that make uh, turns into like five questions. But let's just say that nowhere in Marx and Engels there was uh, a, the definition of socialism as being state property. That was Stalin's construction. Uh, uh, Lenin, there are I can provide all the different quotes, but I think everyone, any person who studied um, Marxism and socialist theory understands that it's a big mistake to equate socialism with state control of the means of production. Uh, one thing is state control of the means of production. And another thing is to say that society controls the economy, which I think we agree. But we know society is not just the state. And we know that social property or uh, property that is controlled by society can take different shapes. One of that being, of course, public enterprises, but also, and very importantly, uh, self-managed enterprises like cooperatives are a form of social property, no? If cooperatives are, and other self-managed uh, business.
business are managed democratically and looking beyond the interests of the groups, which was the criticism that uh, che, no? che Guevara had of socialism in Yugoslavia, uh, you know that it's a, it's a very limiting and a big mistake and that may be the biggest mistake of uh, socialism in the Soviet Union. Um, and so I think that would be my, my biggest uh, reaction to your question, but I think that, um, I think it's, very, it's not uh, um, accurate to equate what happened in Soviet Union, what, what is happening in Cuba, or what is, has happened in Venezuela are very three different uh, experiences. I'm not sure in Venezuela, they even started building socialism. Uh, in Cuba, we, we know we don't have socialism. We know we are striving towards it. And I think uh, the way that enterprises are organized in Cuba are different. State enterprises are different than how they were organized in, in the Soviet Union. Uh, we did copy a lot of the Soviet Union, but we, we tried very, how you say, uh, audaciously to do to do it our way. So I think uh, we did we managed to do things differently than the than the Soviet Union. So I encourage you to read a little more about Cuba and there is some research on Cuban state enterprises and how workers participate. We know it's far from what is needed, but uh, I encourage you to, to do some research on, on Cuba. Yeah. Cliff, do you see Tom Webb's I think, hand? Uh, an example of uh, the difference in state enterprises in Cuba from Soviet Union might be uh, made clear by how the road handled the uh, tobacco sector. Uh, it was It's a big, important sector, and maybe the rum sector. Uh, how are these, apart uh, from gas, how it, is there no self no participation of workers in the management of that? I guess. Uh, I I I can answer the question, but um, I I would say I I I haven't studied that. that I, my understanding that's a joint venture. I'm not sure. Is that what you're trying to get at? Because is the it, thing is that in Cuba. In Cuba, there are different models of state enterprises. Uh, it's hard to it's hard to to generalize. But what I can say is that uh, via the the there are questions about the independence of the unions. I understand that and the role that the unions are playing now with the non-state sector and all that, but uh, the, the unions uh, have a, a voice in the, in the board of directors of the state businesses, as well as a, like representative from, from, the, from, from the youth and the, um, and sometimes the, the, the women and other like, uh, I, now I know like de and depending on how, um, how the, the enterprise is organized is the, the um, and, and the leadership of these, the people who take those roles, uh, how much the workers can influence the, the, the decision-making in their own business. We know that the biggest, problem is the coordination system no is that the workers can decide with the uh, management of their enterprise they can decide one thing but the ministry then decides something else and they change whatever they had agreed democratically has to be adapted to the new directive so um yeah i do agree that there are significant problems in, and that's one of the biggest challenges that QI is facing today, which is they know they have seen the private sector take off. They have uh, not supported the cooperative sector to continue its growth. 
and the state businesses are uh, facing many challenges so they are stagnated or in decline and that uh, i think the current government leadership has realized they need to act and that uh, um, hopefully i'm not I, i'm not gonna burn my hands on, i'm not gonna put my hand on fire but hopefully there is an understanding for the need to do a total revamp or of how uh, Cuban state businesses are managed and the whole like economic uh, coordination system. Because before there were some attempts to allow, for example, workers now can uh, like benefit their income depends on productivity. They work them. Uh, the, the businesses, state businesses, can decide more on like the the, the surpluses, how they allocate, et cetera, et cetera. But it's like uh, band aids or like um, you know like very uh, that some measures have been taken that are like, but it's not like the uh, whole system or a uh, kind of like. Uh, change, no, and so you. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest challenges uh, that Cuba is facing, and yeah, depending on that, I uh, will see where where socialism or the idea of building socialism in Cuba, if it gets closer or or farther away, no. So I would I would just say say that. Lots to say about it, but. <laughs> Well, I want to, uh, to Tom Webb. Ah, Tom. Tom had a question. Sorry. Yeah. His hand was up from before. Yeah. No, I actually had taken my hand down. Actually, I, I did. I did, I did put it up again, and and I. Uh, and I, the original question that I was going to uh, address to Camilla is that, you know, in, in, in Canada, and I, I know this is true in the US as well, one of the major problems facing cooperatives is what I would call a capitalist culture. So we have a tremendous difficulty in getting managers of cooperatives not to think and act uh, as if they were running capitalist businesses. And, and so that's, you know, and you, you see it in our credit unions and you see it in, in, in our big consumer co-ops. Um, and those are also the co-ops that in certain way, in many ways are the weakest forms of cooperation because the level of member participation is very, very low. So if you go to a typical credit union meeting in Canada and the United States and there's 2%, of the members attending the meeting, uh, they say, isn't this wonderful? This is great. If you go to a housing co-op meeting, uh, there'll be 75% of the members there because that's where they live. And if you go to a worker co-op meeting, the ones who aren't there are sick. Uh, so the, 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 so I, I, I was going to ask originally whether or not the socialist culture, the, the state run culture, uh, so what I would call state socialism, as opposed to what they have in Russia, which is state capitalism, uh, and what they have in China is state capitalism, uh, where you you know you have this very very rich group who run the country, uh, and they you know and and uh, I I would comment on the on the political directions that seem to be. Um, uh, from uh, from north of the border, pretty frightening in the U.S. As as I watch what's happening and the control of the government by the super rich. Uh, but what I was going to ask was, is the uh, is the the, the sort of state uh, run uh, uh, enterprise system? Does that pose a state culture? Uh, problem for the workers and the farmers. No, I I I, I had uh, addressed this. Uh, I think Tom, when you were there, uh, I think I still man 
maintain my position that I think we in Cuba uh, are fortunately to be very, and this is what we have seen, no? Like, despite the fact that of all that, it, oh, like everywhere that you have seen development of cooperative, you have had uh, things that we don't have in Cuba, like a, the uh, institution that does promotion, an institution that does specialized supervision, an entity, the um, organization of representation of the cooperatives, not to say the three months, a general a cooperative, a law, a general law for cooperatives that we don't have in Cuba, four things that are crucial. And still we have seen a growth of cooperatives in Cuba. Uh, yeah, at, at this point it's around 65% or 70 of the new non-agricultural cooperative came out uh, out of state enterprises, no? And and what I what I have seen in studying those is that because unlike some would ex would think, no, people who don't really haven't studied and have visited and a uh, worker sorry, state businesses in Cuba, if you go to those businesses, you see that there is not a big uh, uh, the, uh, the different social, the difference in social status between the manager, the state manager and the worker. In Cuba, pretty much across society, uh, there is, a, even if you have an income that is much lower than someone who is, uh, people see each other as, as equals, no? And that happens even more in state uh, businesses, no? Like, yeah, you, you respect the hierarchy, but you know, it's a functional hierarchy, it's not a social hierarchy. And so I think people in state businesses are very well prepared to get organized themselves as a cooperative. There might be some people who are used to having been told what uh, what to do, no? So like the vertical culture, but I think that is many times used by the state to to say to to demand initiative while while not acknowledging that people don't have the autonomy to make decisions, no? So the minute people have the autonomy to make decisions they're gonna use it and and that's what we saw in in our study i said what was the most important like difference or benefit that and and what they said the most yeah we have increased our our income for times on average we have we now how we now can invest on improving our working conditions no we can this but the most important thing is now we can decide we can make the decisions of how to run our business. So the decision making is what they appreciated the most. And I think, yeah, the, I think uh, Cubans in state businesses are very well prepared the minute they are allowed. No, I'm not saying that every state business should be converted into a cooperative, of course. Uh, I, I'm just saying that Cuba should uh, resume that policy of transferring a non strategic activities, businesses to the workers. If the workers want to or be organized as a cooperative, let them do it, no? Yeah. Cliff, you're muted. You're still muted, Cliff. We nobody can hear you. So, uh, since uh, Cliff has his uh, t shirt. And he had asked me about the situation in Cuba. I'm just, while they, they get their mic or whatever they need to decide there, I would just say that, um, yeah, if you are thinking about taking a vacation in a warm place, 
uh, go to Cuba, we do need those uh, that hard currency. Uh, um, it, there, there is a very uh, sad, uh, how you say, information uh, warfare against Cuba. Um, and the US government, of course, leading that and with the, all the measures to put Cuba in the terrorist list, plus the fact that people like from Europe uh, who go to Cuba then might have problems traveling to the US. So it, it plus, of course, I'm sure there are, uh, there might be some problems on, on the Cuba side, but um, uh, the recovery of the tourism industry has been slower and especially like the number of people going to Cuba has been slower than or smaller than expected. So if you want to have a summer vacation anytime and visit some cooperatives, uh, I would encourage you to do that. And if you have any way of um, joining advocacy efforts or supporting in any way to lift the sanctions, and, and the embargo and blockade, uh, we would really appreciate that. And the cooperatives, we, I, maybe I can say I'm volunteering for an organization called Alliance for Cuban Engage, Engagement and Respect. Acere. And, mm -hmm. Acere. and I'm going to put the link there because you can be aware of what's happening and sign a letters that are sent to Congress people and the Biden administration. Right now we're focusing on taking Cuba out of the list of countries that sponsor terrorism, which was a, a move, a dirty move that Trump did a few days before leaving office. And the Biden administration, of exactly. course, is not, yeah, hasn't done anything. Cliff, with your permission, could I just uh, report on something? Oh, there. Uh, the Center for Global Justice is uh, sending a trip to Cuba uh, next month. Uh, we will be there from March 10th to the 20th. If you would like to join that trip, you can do so uh, by writing to globaljusticecenter.org. Um, you can register there on our website. Um, Mark, did you have uh, another question? I, not a question. I just wanted to share with, with uh, comrades uh, um, an event that happened on the 29th of January. Some of you are familiar with the fact that every Sunday at the end of the month in Miami, a Puentes de Amor uh, car, bicycle, walking caravan, it's occurred in other cities, um, not only in the US, uh, Canada, and well, a few times in Cuba. But anyway, for the first time, uh, the uh, in recent months at least, the caravan was attacked by uh, um, anti-Cuban um, vigilantes, I would call them. And the police uh, didn't provide the protection that they have in previous months. So there was actually quite brutal attack. Um, and, uh, and, and the police not only didn't step in to prevent it, but they also didn't step in to break it out. And uh, the, the caravanistas were, um, on their own, basically. So there is a plan to 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 build a to to take a legal case against the uh, Miami police for this. Um, you know, again, this is the first time they've really um, allowed the violence to take place, and and I just wanted folks to be aware of it. And I'll get more information and share it with Cliff, and he can share it with others uh, um, in in the center. Okay, well, I want to thank uh, Camila for a very interesting and informative presentation. Uh, nice to see you again, Camila. Um, and uh, those who uh, the, those who are here with us now can see 
the uh, this webinar uh, available on YouTube along with all of our others. Um, just go to our website, um, globaljusticecenter.org. Uh, next, uh, next Monday, we will have as our speaker, Oh, right, Henry Veltmeyer, um, who has uh, written extensively on Latin America. Um, and he will be talking about the, uh, the leftward trend in Latin America. Um, and uh, on Thursday this week at 11.30, we will be showing the film King in the Wilderness about the uh, uh, last couple of years of Martin Luther King's life. Uh -huh. So join us uh, for those events. Uh, and hopefully you will join us for our visit to Cuba as well. Uh, so let me give thanks to our webinar team, um, Bob Stone, Liz Mestris, um, Roberto Robles, um, Betsy Bowman, uh, and myself. And now this is Cliff Duran signing off. Thank you all. Take care. Sure. Bye. And thank you. Tell me that we see uh, on Friday there's something that's on, on Mike. Do you know where that is? Uh, oh, yeah. Is that the, the BBC?